Yep, there we go. All right, so everything looks good. <clears throat> All right, so this is the last screen that I left you guys with last Wednesday. So I hope many of you had the time to at least think about it over the weekend. You know, in other words, try to formulate the problem and relate it to the concepts that we have learned so far. Um, because that's going to be the first thing we're going to do today is to figure this out. All right. So what we'll do is to revisit the uh, question first. So every packet has 1,024 bits, 1 kilobits. P is the chance or probability of a successful transmission. In other words, a one that is transmitted is received as a one. The chances of a packet transmitted correctly. Okay, there we go. So we are interested in a packet being transmitted correctly, and we can afford to have up to 16 bits of error in every packet. So that's you know the problem that we want to find out is what are the chances that a packet will actually get through successfully so that it doesn't have to be retransmitted and causing insufferable lag time in your game. So you always have to relate this to things that you want to do. It's like, I want to play my games you know, with as little lag as possible. So kind of relay that. All right, so having described the problem, what is the solution? Have you guys thought about the solution to this problem? How do you figure it out? Well, first of all, what kind of probability stuff are we talking about? You, you, you have an empty tray right now, okay? You know, I want you to design a certain product, okay? A robot, okay? Or a rocket, a drone, or something like that. So what do you, how do you start the process? You cannot just you know, kind of think about, okay, I'm going to get a full specification with every design detail the first time. That's not going to happen. So what do you do? If you're designing a drone, what do you throw into the bin? Um, I think I need uh, impellers. I think I need DC motors. I think I need flight control, blah, blah, blah. Okay, throw all the components in and go like, okay, these things is are what I need. If you're designing a robot that is land-based, then you need to think about Okay, I'm going to have to throw in wheels, okay, or track um, threads, threads. Um, I have to throw in motion sensors. I have to throw in, you know, um, cameras and so on and so forth. So in this case, we are solving this problem. What are you going to throw in the bin to begin with? Because if, you're, if your bin is not empty, at least you have a few items, you can start with that. Your brain can start to make connections to other components that are related. But your, when your bin is empty, you're kind of stuck there. So what do we start with? Throw me some terms that we have talked about over the past two, three weeks. Yes. Huh? Combination. OK, so we somebody started with a combination, which is actually related. It's just in a very interesting way. So I'm going to write it down anyway. OK, combination. What about the way we describe experiments? OK, look at the transmission of 1,024 bits as a really kind of awkward, long experiment. So when we talk about experiment, it is a sequence of hmm? what is each step? A trial, okay? So we're talking about experiment, trials, okay? So let's throw those terms in, okay? Because what I'm trying to do is to help you develop a process so that when you, when we have the final exam, you guys can have at least a process to get started, okay? Okay, so we have an experiment that consists of 1,024 trials because there are 1,024 bits to transmit and receive, okay? And each trial has, mm, what kind of outcome are we looking at here? Okay, so you look at each trial, it has outcomes. So let's just take a look at the first trial. In other words, we look at the first bit being transmitted. What outcomes are possible? What do we care about? Something is transmitting a bit, right? 
and something is trying to receive that bit. So what are the outcomes? Yes. Yep, so we can say succeed or fail or correct, incorrect, okay? Either, doesn't matter, okay? Uh, what about the next bit, okay? We're now looking at the, the second bit being transmitted. What kind of outcome are we looking at? Same, okay? So that means, you know, these trials are with or without replacement. What are those terms? What does it mean when I say without replacement? Give me an example of experiments where uh, the trials are without replacement. That's kind of how we started this entire discussion of probabilities. So what is a good example of something that is without replacement? Yes. The lotto, very good. Okay, so if you take something out of the bag and you don't put it back in, so that that is no longer an option for the next of all the following you know, trials, it is without replacement. So in the case of bit transmission, if the first bit was successful, is the second bit guaranteed, it cannot be successful. That doesn't make sense, right? So it is with or without replacement this time. With replacement, very good. Okay. Okay, and exactly how many outcomes are we looking at per trial? No, for each trial. In other words, for every bit being transmitted and received, what are the outcomes? What are the two possible outcomes? I just said the answer. <laughs> there are two, okay? There are two outcomes for every single trial. Okay, so two outcomes for every trial, per trial, okay. Um, so which way is it pointing to you? Is it pointing to the direction of, well, maybe this is a lotto problem, or is it pointing to the other kind of problem, which is a coin flip problem? We really only have two, those two major categories of problems to solve, okay? So which one is it? Coin flip, okay. So that should remind you of the coin flip problem. And we're trying to calculate, you know, this is a very odd thing, because, you know, it's imagine that you're throwing a coin 1,024 times, okay? And we'll just say that heads up is representing successful, and tails up means it is unsuccessful, fail, okay? So we are looking for, you know, up to 16 tails up, and the rest must be heads up. That's the probability that we're looking for. Is that okay? So you have to be able to make these associations in your head and relate all the topics that we have talked about so far, okay? So right now, I have not talked about any math yet, okay? No equations, no math. We are just associating the concepts. We're trying to apply what we have learned. It's a, I would say this is a pattern recognition kind of process. You see some patterns in the past, I give you a new problem, you're trying to fit that new problem into patterns that you have already known, and you go like, okay, which problem pattern does it fit the most? Coin flips, okay? All right, so with coin flips, um, now we, we are trying to dive into the math issues, okay? So what did we talk about that are related to flipping coins? What was the very last thing that I did, you know, that gigantic proof that I kind of went through in class. What was it? Okay, we used proof by induction, but that was just a technique to prove a theorem that is kind of handy to have when we are analyzing a specific category of problems. So which theorem did we prove? Hmm? No, we, we, we proved Pascal's identity, but that was also just a utility step in order to get to a particular theorem. There's only one thing in that entire module that, that says blah, blah, blah theorem. What is it? Sorry? 
binomial theorem. Okay, so we are looking at the binomial theorem. So what does the binomial theorem say? Okay, I can withstand awkward silence, probably more so than most other people, because I have been trained for twenty-four years to do this. Okay, looking at me, it's not going to solve that problem. What do you do? Yes. Very good. You are absolutely correct. Okay, the binomial theorem goes like this: p plus q to the power of n is the summation of i going from zero to n, and then each term we are adding is n choose i times p to the power of i times q to the power of n minus i, and the binomial theorem says for every n in the set of natural number, this has to be true. Okay. All right. How does that relate to our problem? It's the binomial theorem. So you look at the binomial theorem, and then you have to look at these terms and go like, okay, if I were to apply the binomial theorem to help me solve this problem, what is p? What is q? What is n? And what are we looking at here? Okay. So I, I will prompt you. I will treat you like Chat GPT. I will give you prompts, and then you'll give me answers. How about that? Yes. Okay. So, all right. Okay. So. Let's try to look at this in a different way. Okay, let's look at this from the tree perspective. Okay, I really like the tree perspective. It is very visual, and it actually illustrates the concepts really well. All right, so this is the beginning of the entire entire experiment, and this is my first trial. Okay, and we already we already know that for each coin flip, there are two possible outcomes. We'll say it is successful versus it is a fail. Okay. And according to the problem description, the chances of receiving a bit correctly is p, and the chances of receiving a bit incorrectly is going to be one minus p. But I'm not. I'm going to call it q here. Is that okay? All right. So this is for one single bit. So that means now I have to look at this for two bits, right? And then you're going to label this as successful. This is fail. This is successful. This is fail. This has a chance of p. This has a chance of q. A chance of p. A chance of q, and so on. Right? So we have to do this many, many times. In other words, your tree is going to be 1,024 levels deep. I'm not, I'm not going to draw that tree here. Because if I were to draw this tree, how many leaf nodes are we looking at? You just have to give me the the expression. You don't have to give me the actual number. Two to the power of one thousand twenty-four. Yes. So this is that's a lot of leaf nodes. I'm not going to draw that. Okay. But at each leaf node, it's going to be a sequence, right? Of you know, the first one is going to be all successful. The last one is going to be all fail. One thousand and twenty-four of those. One thousand and twenty-four of those. Does that make sense to you? Because to get to the very last leaf node, it's going to have to follow the fail, 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 fail all the way to the very last leaf node. And to get to the top leaf node, it's going to have to follow the success, success, success all the way to the last leaf node. So in between, okay. So in between here, there will be some that has one error bit. There'll be some that has two error bits. There'll be some that has three error bits, and so on. So if you look at each individual leaf node here, it is unique in the sense that the error bits 
are at different positions. So if you look at all the ones that have one single error bit, one of these, you know, leaf node, is going to have the error bit all the way at the beginning. So one of these, these will have the error bit being in, at the second position, bit one, and the last one is going to have the error bit all the way to the last bit, which is bit 1023. Does that make sense to you? Okay. But, you know, from my perspective, I go like, I can fix one bit of transmission error because the premise was I can have up to 16 bits in the transmission of the entire 1024 bits, and I can still self-correct, you know, the bits that are transmitted incorrectly. Is that okay? <clears throat> okay. So after looking at this tree, going back to here, can you give me some idea of what is P, what is Q, and what is N? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then Q is going to be 1 minus P, which is the probability of failing. Failing, you know, the failure of transmitting a bit. Okay, very good. And then you look at this whole thing, go like, but it still doesn't make sense. Okay, why do we care? Because P plus Q is guaranteed to be one. It's like, it doesn't matter what N is, it's going to be one. So why do we care about N? Well, okay, so think about it. If you look at the probabilities of every single, of the sum of all the leaf nodes, it has to be one, because this covers every single possible outcome for the entire experiment. So it has to come to one. So it is not the one that is making, making it interesting. It is how much of the one fall into the event set that we are interested in. Okay, so next is we talked about something of, about the event set. What exactly is the event set? I mean, not in this specific case, but in general, what is the term event set referring to? First of all, it has to satisfy one requirement. How does it relate to the outcome set of the entire experiment, which usually is called omega? I would suggest a little bit of a review and studying as we go along with the material. So, but I will ask the question one more time. How does the event set relate to the set of all the possible outcome before the entire experiment? Yes. Omega, which is, yep. Okay, very good. Okay, so we know the event set has to be a subset of omega, and omega is the symbol representing all the possible experiment outcome, not individual trial. Okay, so what is the event set? I mean, other than it's a subset of omega, you know, what is it? It consists of experiment outcomes that, that we are interested in, okay? so. Okay, so that's kind of vague, right? It doesn't give you a very definitive process of, oh, so this is how we're going to derive membership of the event set. No, it does not, okay? It just says, yeah, it is a subset of all the possible outcomes, but these are the outcomes that we are interested in. So get back to your gaming mindset, okay, which shouldn't take most people a lot of times, like two milliseconds, I'm back to the gaming mindset. Okay, so you're, you have, you're, you're having horrendous, lag time, okay? So what event set are we talking about here? We, we don't want lag time, right? We want minimal lag time. So which subset of this omega is going to give you minimal lag time? Yes? Exactly. Okay, so you're both correct, okay? It is, that's indeed our event set because that, those particular packets 
are of interest to us, okay? So that means, you know, the membership of E. So if I look at one single packet, okay? And, you know, let's say it is a member of E. We want this packet to have 16 or less uh, transmission transmission errors, okay? Is that okay? So you have to make those association and links you know, you know, when you're solving the problem. It's like, okay, what is my event set? Oh, okay, everything that has 16 or less transmission errors. So we'll start with zero, okay? Okay, so how does that relate to the binomial theorem? How do, forget about the for all n you know, as an element of n. What is n anyway? I think we answered that question earlier already. It's 1,024, okay? So that means this sigma is gonna have 1,025 terms because I goes from zero to 1,024. So that's why it has 1,025 terms. So of those 1,025 terms, which one is corresponding to, well, guess what? There's no error at all. I just need an expression for that term. Go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so we'll just say the probability of no error whatsoever is of the 1,024 bits, all 1,024 bits are successful, which means the probability is going to be P to the power of 1,024 and Q is raised to the power of zero because nothing was transmitted incorrectly. Is that okay? So this is the probability of having no error whatsoever. So I'm gonna challenge you to ask about one single error bit. So how would you formulate one single error bit? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Mm hmm. Okay. This is that's supposed to be a three. So let me see if I can. Nope. When I don't want it to do it, it does it. But when I want it to do it, it doesn't do it. That's okay. Nope. Get that problem fixed here. Cut that. And this is P to the power of 1,023. Okay. All right. Do you want me to enumerate, meaning that list every single possible one, or do you think I can just kind of skip to the very last one? Let's skip to the last one. So the last ones that I can still accept is up to 16 error bits. And what is that gonna look like? Of the 1,024 bits being transmitted. Yep. So of 1,024, 1,008 are successful, okay? Which means P has to be raised to the power of 1,008, right, okay, and Q has to be raised to the power of exactly 16, okay? You go like, okay, Tech, what does this have anything to do with a sigma notation, this thing over here? We know N is 1,024. Each of these terms is, how, how, how does each term here, one, two, three, and the other 13 in between. What does each term, how, the, how does each term relate to the binomial theorem, especially on the sigma side? Go ahead. Right, right. Exactly. So that means instead of having the i to go from zero to 1,024, we can change where it starts. 
it, it's no longer the binomial theorem, okay? But the quantity, the probability that we are interested in is based on this binomial theorem. We just have to say, no, no, we don't need all the terms. We just need some of them, okay? So that means our answer here, the overall answer, the probability of a packet transmitted correctly is going to be, I'm going to be lazy and use the sigma notation because otherwise I'm going to have to write 16 of these things, which is going to take a while, okay? That's the reason why we are computer science majors, okay? We want to simplify things, automate things. We don't want to do things manually, right? Because if you like to do things manually and tediously and mundanely, I'm afraid computer science may not be a good fit. I'm not, I'm only half joking here, okay? You know, the other half is definitely not joking. You know, because you know, the mindset of people in computer science is I want to look at the pattern. Once you figure out the pattern, I want to look at the pattern of the pattern. Once you figure out the pattern of the pattern, you want to figure out the pattern of the pattern of the pattern. That is what chat GPT or all the multi-layer neural networks are doing. They're looking at sub abstraction, patterns, patterns of patterns, patterns of patterns and pa of patterns and so on. And the last time I checked, chat GPT 3.5 as a neural net has 96 layers, which means roughly, it is capable of figuring out the pattern of pattern of pattern. Repeat that 96 times. That's the capability of chat GPT, or at least the, uh, the training model behind chat GPT. Okay, so that's important, okay? You know, this is not an AI class, it's not a neural network class, but I think in general, it's, uh, it's good to understand those specific, those terms. So here, we are, we are basically starting at 1008, because 1008 correct transmissions is the minimum that we want, you know, in terms of not having to retransmit the packet. And we can take all the way up to 1024, because that's the size of the entire packet. And then each uh, time, <clears throat> we use 1024, which is taking the place of N, choose I, P to the power of I, Q to the power of 1024 minus I, that is our answer. So are we doing okay so far? Okay. So when you look at a solution, okay, when you look at this slide and when you look at your notes, okay, I certainly hope that you are taking notes. Even though I'm recording everything here, you should be taking notes of how the steps connect, okay? You know, how, your, how your own mind is connecting all the steps. So memorizing this slide or having this slide available to you in the final exam may help you up to a certain extent, okay? But it's not gonna help you make that connection between the problem and what kind of tools you need to solve the problem, okay? That part still relies on how do you analyze the problem, taking the problem itself apart to the point where you recognize, you know, oh, okay, I can see how this problem reminds me of these things that I have learned in class. That is the key of succeeding in an exam, especially mine, okay, because, you know, I am going to test you based on that. You have to be able to analyze the problem and relate it to the tools that we have, you know, learned in the class. All right. So I'm going to take a kind of short pause here and see if there are any questions. Yep, go ahead. Okay, very good. So how do we know that we are supposed to apply the binomial theorem here? So that's when you need to kind of look at the problem and ask what is the experiment, because the lotto problem is an experiment. The birthday problem is an experiment. The uh, coin flip problem is an experiment. So now you have to ask yourself, okay, if the entire thing, in other words, anything that in this class, if I ask about the probability, it is an experiment. So the next question is, what is a trial of this experiment? Okay, there are two main categories here. 
it is either with or without replacement. Okay, um, the lot of problem is without replacement because you cannot have two numbers that are the same on your ticket. So it is without replacement. This one is definitely with replacement because you know, once it's it transmitted, the next one can still be you know, transmitted successfully. Is that okay? So at this point, I understand that um, there are 1,024 trials. Each trial has the same two possible outcomes. Two is a keyword here. How does two relate to the term binomial? B i is two, right? Yeah. So, so that tells me that hmm, maybe it has to do with binomial distribution. The key factor that will kind of con uh, that will kind of like uh, totally link this to the binomial distribution is the chances of transmitting successfully and the chances of not trans not tra tra not transmitted successfully is a probability. Because in the lotto problem, the chances of you know, picking each number is even. There's no lopsided thing going on, okay? But in the coin flip problem, that's when we first introduce and go like, guess what? Some outcomes may have a different probability than the other outcome. So that is the one last step that kind of goes like, yep, this has to be a binomial problem. Then the rest is really look at the binomial theorem and ask yourself, what is P, what is Q? That's typically not too difficult. What is N, which is the number of trials in, in an experiment? And then the rest is really looking at, okay, this thing has a bunch of terms. Which terms are the ones that I need? Okay, so what am I interested in? I'm interested in uh, everything that has 1,008 or more bits being transmitted successfully. And that's how I can determine that these are the ones that I want and those are the terms that I need. So that's kind of my thought process, you know, when, when I'm trying to solve problems like this. Okay. <clears throat> All right. That was a very good question. Any other questions? No other questions? Okay. So in real life, there are a lot of probability problems. You just have to notice those particular problems. Like 30 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago, when you came to the campus and you're looking for a spot to park, okay? So you can ask yourself, what are the chances that I don't have to drive around or have to get to the last row of the parking lot to get a space? That's a probability problem. And it is a discrete, well, okay, sort of discrete pro this, a probability problem, because in this case, it's actually what we call a Poisson uh, probability problem, because it has to do with chances, that has to do with time, which we didn't cover in this class. Okay, any other questions? So as a, as a parting gift for this part of the lecture, I'll give you a problem, okay? So let's say, you know, there are, there are 10 players. And we randomly split those 10 players into two teams. So we have your know, team of five and a team of five. Of the 10 people, three are salty, okay? And any team that has uh, three salty team players is guaranteed to lose the game. Okay, so now the question is, what are the chances that a team is guaranteed to lose just because all three salty people are on that team? Okay, so I'm, I'm casting this problem in terms that many of you know how to understand already, but I want you to figure that out, okay? I want you to figure out that probability We'll do that on Wednesday, okay? So we have two days to try to think about this. Now, there are many ways to go about doing this, okay? You can have, you can have 10 little pieces of paper, okay? Uh, seven are just normal, the other three are marked with an S, which means they are salty, and then you just go like, five on this side, five on the other side, how does it turn out, okay? So that you can understand the process, okay? What is the experiment? 
What is a trial? What is the event set? What is the omega? Okay, so that's how you can kind of get a little practice. Is that okay? All right, so I'm gonna leave the, this one you know, with you guys you know, to think about. When we, I think it's time to move on to a new topic because we are pretty much done with discrete probabilities. So we can now move on to the next module. And we have a choice here, okay? Um, the 9th of May is the last day of lectures. That's a Thursday. So um, we kind of have to plan our time carefully because there are still quite a bit of topic that I need to go over. This class is an interesting class, you know, because the the kind of topic that we go over is kind of like random stuff, okay? Because you know, some of these are closely related and others are kind of like, I don't see the connection. They're all kind of connected in a way in the end, but sometimes it's hard to see how they are connected. So let me show you where we are at this point, okay? Uh, we are currently at the end of discrete probability. I should give you a homework assignment of some kind, um, but I have to think about what kind of homework assignment to give you. So the one that I just gave you, you know, is a practice, okay? You don't have anything to turn in, but I highly recommend that you use it as an exercise to see how well you can apply the concepts that you have learned. So we have um, big O, you know, omega, big Omicron, big om Omega, and big Theta, okay, which just has to do with time complexity. And then we have graph stuff, okay, which includes your know, two algorithms to find the shortest paths. And then we also have predicate calculus, which is kind of a fun little topic because it relates to a programming language called Prolog. And we can do all kinds of you know, fun stuff with uh, predicate calculus. So of these three, they are not the, the ordering is not super important. So I will let you guys kind of choose which one do you want to go next. In terms of importance, okay, let me show you why, why each one is important. The big Omicron, big Omega, and big Theta is, has to do with upper bound and lower bound, typically of time complexity of algorithms. And I think it is pretty hard to navigate around that class in a four-year university. So it's definitely applicable in your future. The graph thing, yeah, I would say it's a basic algorithm that you probably should understand. It makes use of concepts that we have talked a lot, talked a lot about in this class. Uh, the quantifiers, you know, the set notation and stuff like that. And then predicate calculus relates to propositional logic by integrating quantifiers into the whole thing. Propositional logic, the way that we talked about it, cannot handle quantifiers. So it can, you can handle P, Q, R, S, T, each one being a variable. Tech is a good professor. That is not a statement. It is a condition. It can either be true or false. Q means Iraj Subsevary is a good professor. Well, once again, it's a variable. But none of those involves the use of quantifiers. They cannot handle every professor at LRC is blah, blah, blah. Or there exists at least one professor at CRC who is blah, blah, blah. Okay. So predicate calculus is called second degree, um, second order logic, which can handle quantifiers, okay? So from that perspective, it does relate to something that we have learned already, and it applies to automated reasoning, which is kind of interesting because you know, that also links to automated theorem proving and all kinds of cool stuff like that. So of the three, which one do you want to go next? Is there a preference? No preference. Hmm? Either one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So in that case, I'm going to go for uh, big Omicron, big Omega, and Theta. Just because you know, that's the usual order that I go over things. Um, so this is the chapter that we are going to go over. All right.
All right, so this is a little bit long-ish, okay? All right, so the first thing is, you know, we are talking about time complexity. And before we dive into the math and all the equations and the notations of, you know, that relate to time complexity, why is it important? What is time complexity and why is it important? I'm waiting for you guys to, yeah, go ahead. Okay, all right, so we want to choose algorithms that have a lower time complexity because you know, that means you know, things get done quick sooner. Okay, very good. But what exactly is time complexity? We know that it has to do with time it takes to execute and solve a problem, but what exactly is time complexity? Go ahead. Very good, okay. So when you apply logarithm, when you apply exponents, and when you apply squared, what are you applying it to? And what is the context of all that? So, so you're, you're basically talking the log of something, something to the power of two. So what is that something? Go ahead. The number of elements in an array or a set, okay? The size of the problem, okay? In other words, what we are really looking at is the relationship between how much time it takes to solve a problem versus the size of the problem, okay? That is time complexity. Okay, very good. <clears throat> so we talked about why it is important, and then we talk about what it really is. So it's time to kind of give us an example. This is an example. Um, okay, so it's pseudocode, but it does look like C. <clears throat> so we have I, sum, and the array A, which has N elements. And somehow it got initialized. Okay, so don't worry about an uninitialized array. Let's just assume that something is initializing it before we get to this code. I starts from zero. Sum is initialized to zero. While i is less than n, we perform these two lines in the loop. In other words, we're just adding every single element to form a sum. So I need to know what is the amount of time it takes to run this particular algorithm. I want the exact amount of time. So the way we analyze this problem is this is going to take constant time. This is going to take constant time. This by itself takes constant time. But it might, we might have to do it quite a few times, right? Um, this is got, going to take constant time, but we might have to do it a few times. This is going to take constant time, but we might have to do it a few times. So now the question is, how many times do we have to do this? How many times do we have to do this, these two, and so we can so that we can add up the entire time? So if you, um, I'm going to shortcut the answer to here. So if T1 is representing, <clears throat> let's see here, T1 is the initialization. So, and then T2 is the amount of time for the evaluating the condition. And then T3 refers to the amount of time to perform the sum, get sum plus A bracket I, and I gets I plus one, okay? In other words, you know, T1, T2, T3, they are all representing, you know, different aspects of, you know, the amount of time to go through a particular statement in the code. Are we doing okay so far with that? Okay. So the equation turns out to be this, okay? If you know exactly how much time it takes for lines four and five to execute, that's one component. If you know exactly how much time it takes to, evalu to evaluate whether I is less than N, that's T2. But T2 gets broken up into two parts. One is uh, outside of the N times, the other one is inside the N times. And then the amount of time for lines eight and nine to execute together is um, known as T3. So the question is, why do you think we have an extra T2 outside of the multiplication? I think, I, I think you got the hands up first, just, just by hair, go ahead. Exactly. Yeah, that's uh, what I was going to say. It's the um, <clears throat> basically first check to see 
is not just true and it will then enter the wild loop accordingly. It's the last one that is the extra one. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Yep. Because n is less than n, it's going to be true exactly n times, but you need it to be false to get out of the loop. So that becomes yeah. the extra t2 that is not inside the n times. Yep, but you're correct, okay? So both of you are correct why we have an extra T2 that is outside of the multiplication because we need that one last evaluation of the condition to say, oh, okay, it's time to get out of the loop. Okay, so this is great, right? We, we now end up with the exact amount of time to execute this algorithm. But this is a really simple algorithm to analyze. So when you look at something that's more complex, okay, so when we go to uh, bubble sort, okay, so bubble sort is kind of more like this, okay, it has three components to it. There's one constant time component when your array has n elements. There's one component that is linear to um, the total number of elements. And there's one component that is uh, basically proportional to the square of the number of elements in the array. Okay, and as you analyze more and more difficult algorithms, you know, the equation gets a little bit longer, more complex, you know, with, with, with some really kind of funky terms and whatnot. So the bottom line is, I don't really need to know all this, okay? I just need to know what we call the order of magnitude. In other words, I just need to know enough so that I can compare two algorithms and go like, yep, definitely choose this one. Does that make sense to you? You know, we just need to make a choice. We just need to say, choose one of these things. So as long as I have enough information to make that choice, I don't need to know a whole lot of details. Is that okay? So we want to lose some details, but without losing the ability to choose the best algorithm for the job. That is why we need to look at the order of time complexity and not the exact time complexity. Because the exact time complexity also depends on a whole bunch of other things. How many people know the merge sort algorithm? Okay, Did, were you guys taught the recursive one that works on arrays? Okay, the best example of merge sort is the one that is not recursive, that does not work on arrays, but instead it works on tape of mainframe computers. Okay. So you guys are looking good. I'll give you an example, okay? So let me give yourself, uh, let me switch to, okay. So I give myself an array that is not sorted. It's hard to come up with random numbers. I'll try my best. Uh, we got seven right now. Uh, seven is good, okay. So this is the original sequence. And imagine this is on a magnetic tape. So one thing you don't want to do with a magnetic tape or anything that is on tape is random access. Ran random access means, oh, go here, go to the third item, and then go to the last one, and then go back all the way to the second item from the beginning, and then the second last item, and so on. Because it's not constant time anymore. Array access is constant time in C, C++, and most programming languages. But when it is a list like this, then it is not linear anymore, okay? We, don't, we want to avoid that random access thing, which means the best way to do this is really just start from the beginning and go through each one and go all the way to the end, okay? That's the best way to access a sequence, a tape, a linked list. They're basically the same concept. So with merge sort, okay, that is not recursive and applied in this way, what I'm doing is I'm trying to look at the uh, each record of the sequence and go like, okay, I'm just going to split it into two, okay? So I'll take the five, okay? And then I, and then I look at the three. I want everything to be in, in non-decreasing order. So if I put a three here, it's going to uh, break, it's not going to, it is not continuing the run, okay? It's not sorted anymore. So I put three over here. And then I have a six. So should I put six after the five or should I put six after the three? Actually, in this case, uh, we don't really have a choice. We put six over here and then we put seven over here. The zero can, it's gonna break both of the runs. 
So I'm going to put a zero here because we I need to alternate between the two. The two is continuing the run. The one is going to break both. So I'm going to put it over here. In other words, I ended I identified runs. This is a run. This is a run. This is a run. This is a run, and this is a run. And I just you put the runs alternately into the two output tapes, so to speak. Is that okay? So now I look at the two output tapes and go like, okay. Um, so I would look at the three versus the five, and I go like, hmm, okay, I'll, I'll choose the five. And now I have to choose between the five and the six. I'm going to choose the five because I want to maximize the run that I can end up with. And then I'm going to choose the six. Then I have to choose between the zero and the seven. Seven it is. And now, no matter what I choose, I'm going to break the run, right? Because at this point, um, I, have, I have to choose between this one over here versus the zero all the way over there. It's going to break it anyway. If you're going to break it anyway, choose the smaller one. So I'm going to choose the zero. And then between the one and the two, I choose the one. And then I choose the two. So that's a merge, okay? So from here to here is what we call a split. And then from the split back to here is called a merge. So what do I do now? Well, first of all, I need to kind of keep track of, is it sorted now? No, it's not sorted. So I'm gonna do the split again. But this time, the longest run, the first run, ah, it's pretty long. I mean, then we got four items. And the second run is over here. So now I go like, okay, the entire first run goes to one output in the split. The entire second run goes to the other you know, output in the split. So once again, I do a split. And now I can do the merge again. So in this merge, I choose the zero, I choose the one, I choose the two, and then the three, five, six, seven, and now it is sorted. So this is merge sort that is applied to three tapes. So you have one initial input tape, two output, and then you flip, it, you flip them around. The two output tapes become input. The one input tape becomes the output. So you basically do the split, merge, split, merge, split, merge, until the whole thing is sorted. This is guaranteed um, <clears throat> n log n, n being the number of items. And this is kind of interesting because in the past, okay, this is valuable because people were storing data on like gigantic long tape, you know, with the, the mainframes you'll know, make use of. And it's good that you don't have to go back and forth because that is tear and wear on the tape. And reading in one direction is usually really fast, okay, by comparison, you know, with those you know, tape mechanisms. And this only requires mono direction travel with every single sequence. In other words, if you don't have arrays in the programming language and you only have linked list, it will work equally fast. It doesn't need random access you know, to the elements in the sequence. Is that okay? How is that relevant now? You guys go like, you know, we, we don't use tapes anymore. You know, we have SSDs, we have you know, massive amount of RAM, and most of the time we can fit everything that I need to sort in memory. So why do I care? Because memory is random access. Or is it? Do you think computer memory is random access? Sort of. Do you think it has a sequential nature to it? Also sort of. So it all depends on how much do you understand about DDR. What is DDR? How many people put a computer together? When was the last time you bought RAM for your computer? What is DDR? Oh, okay. Then you put computers together. Okay. Double data rate. Double data rate is DDR. So double data rate RAM, okay, DDR RAM, has a very interesting perspective, uh, characteristic. It only kicks in, okay, the super fast you know, burst mode of transferring data is block by block, okay? In other words, if you want to get to a certain location and go like, I just need that one byte over there, 
and then the next byte location is all the way over there, it's still going to be slow. Okay, there's nothing fast about DDRM when you're doing quote unquote random access. On the other hand, if you say I'm going to read a chunk of this array in, you know, in, and I'm going to access that array sequentially, like the summation algorithm. Okay, it's reading it from you know, one end to the other end. It's sequential, right? So in that case, what happens is um, your processor will try to say, I need uh, that location in RAM, okay? The memory controller of your processor, which is kind of a chip that programmers are not aware of, but it is there, is going to go like, uh, let me go to the cache first, okay? Do you guys know what is cache? C-A-C-H-E in the context of a processor. No? All right. Well, some of you, if you're taking CISP 310 from me or have taken CISP from me, you should probably have some memory of what cache is because sometimes I talk about that. So cache is really fast, okay? Cache can, for the most part, keep up with the processing speed of your processor, which is great, okay? But there's only a little bit of that, okay? You know, in other words, we have, like, megabytes, hundreds of megabytes of cache at the most. That's level three cache. So it would try to go to the cache first and go like, okay, did we access you know, that chunk of memory recently? If not, I'm going to go out to actual memory and get it. So getting to actual memory is a very, very slow process, okay? It takes a huge amount of time. If you think about your, um, okay, very few, very few of you are taking notes, okay? So you're taking notes, thank you. So think of your notebook here as cache, okay? So most of the time, if you say, if you say oh, I got it you know, in my notebook, you can just flip the, that page and you, you get to the content really fast. By comparison, if something is in memory but not in cache, it is like me telling you to go to the library to get a few pages of content. So would you rather be flipping the pages on your notebook or do you want to go back and forth between here and the library? unless you want to exercise, <laughs> right? So that's the whole deal. Okay, so now the next question is, okay, I say, okay, turn to page uh, 674 of the textbook, and you go, you look through your, 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 your notebook and go like, darn it, I don't have that in my notebook. I have to go to the library, okay? So are you going to make a photocopy of just that one page? Or do you think, well, tech tends to teach in a sequential way, okay? I'm gonna make a photocopy of the next 64 pages. Seems to make sense to me, right? Does that make sense, okay? That's how DDRM works, okay? Is when the cache or when the memory controller says, I don't have that in the cache, we might have to go all the way out to the library to get the content. Oh, by the way, since you're going to the library, go make 64 pages of copy, bring it back, because I'm fairly sure that we need the next 64 pages. Is that okay? So this is what we call burst mode transfer. And it's the burst mode transfer that's making use of what we call the double data rate mechanism. Because typically, when you transfer memory, it can only uh, transfer a chunk of memory on every rising clock, a rising edge or falling edge, pick one. Okay, double data rate, the original double data rate means it will do one transfer, one for the rising edge and one for the falling edge. Now we have DDR4, DDR5, DDR6, and those are even more magical because they can do a transfer between the edges. But that only happens when you're making 64 pages of copy at the library. Okay, is that okay? All right, so when you think about sorting algorithms, Quicksort is not very friendly in this particular mechanism because quicksort goes like, if you look at the access pattern to the um, items in, the, in, in an array with quicksort, it's all over the place. There's no particular pattern to it. So that means you are going back and forth between here and the library all day long because the 64 pages that you make is not useful. Okay, the next time you do access it is not on one of the 64 pages that you brought back. So now you have to run to the library again. What about this mechanism? Add 
it's sequential. Yep, so you're going through the 64 pages sequentially. So you go like page one, page two, all the way up to page 64, and then you run out. Then you have to make another trip to the library. But you saved yourself 63 trips already. So when you need to go to the library again, you make another six, you make photocopies of another 64 pages and you come back and you don't have to go to the library for a while. Is that making any sense? So in a very strange way, DDRM, which is a very modern technology um, that works on RAM, which is supposed to be random access, because after all, that's its name. What is, why do you think RAM is called RAM? Random access memory, right? It is supposed to be random access, but because of the mechanism to make it more efficient, it has a sequential element to it too. So when you analyze the time complexity of algorithms, technically speaking, you should take all of this into consideration. That means the equations that you're gonna be de dealing with is gonna be horrendously complicated. It's not gonna be clean like this because it also depends on page size, right? So every time you go to the library, are we making 64 pages of photocopies of 64 pages of 128, okay? How long does it take you to go to the library? Those are all factors that you have to put into the equation for the exact amount of time. But we don't really care about the exact amount of time. We just need to know enough to say bubble sort, bad. Nerd sort, good. That's all we need. So it is about the order of magnitude, and that's the reason why we have to look into you know, this particular topic because we just want to know enough to make comparisons. Now, when you compare two algorithms and they both have n log n as the time complexity, then you have to look into the more, the, the constants, the coefficients a little bit more, and then you go like, okay, between these two, they have the same time complexity, so which one should I choose? Then you have to refine you know, the way you analyze the problem and you choose the one that is going to edge out the other one. All right, so <clears throat> with all that said, we're gonna to transition to section 2.2, which is comparing algorithms, which is basically the same point that I'm trying to make. We just need to know the order of magnitude. We don't know, need to know the details. So now we need a language to express how does this compare to that, okay? So the, um, the language that we need to talk about those things start with asymptotic estimates. In other words, as n gets larger and larger, what is the general behavior of the time complexity? That's all we want to know. Question, no, okay. What was the last time you learned about this word or encountered this word? Or you have, have you ever encountered this word? Asymptotic. What does it mean? Yep. It's not undefined. It is just like, what is the trend as n gets really big? Oh. Yeah. So let's go ahead and look at the terms because this is a term that you will probably encounter again in um, computer science. It is a kind of important term to understand. Okay. Approaching a given value or condition. So it has to do with approaching. So when was the last time you learned about the term approach? Calculus, okay, very good. So calculus is a continuous math, and this class is basically not continuous math. You know, that's why the name discrete. So, but we can still have asymptotic analysis because we can say as n gets larger and larger and larger, as n approaches, what is the term that we refer to? Ah, big, like really big. Infinity, okay. So, so to quote, I know you guys will remember this, but not the actual content or how it relates to the class material. Buzz Lightyear like to say what? To infinity and beyond. That's right, okay? 
That's what we are trying to do, is to infinity and beyond. <laughs> I know. What are you thinking about? What is, what is in your mind, mind's eye? Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> All right. So now we need to define some terms, OK? So we are going to define some terms here. And we'll define what is a supreme num first. Supremum. Supremum. All right. So we'll we'll look at these things very carefully. Okay. You know, we have to read this sentence by sentence and digest the sentences carefully. First of all, we'll say that let set A be a partial order. That means we can define the less than or equal to relation for the Cartesian product A times A such that it is reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight the sentence that we are analyzing up to this point. Do we understand what this means? A is a set, okay? A set can be of any kind of elements. And then we're defining the relation that has the name of less than or equal to. So don't think about this as actually less than or equal to. Think of it as just a weird name for a relation, which is a subset of the Cartesian product between A and A. Okay, so I hope you guys still remember the relation discussion, okay? All I need is for this relation over A to be partially ordered. I don't even need it to be totally ordered. It only has to be partially ordered. So in order for something to be partially ordered, it has to be reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. Those are the only three properties in order for something to be um, partially ordered. So the term less than or equal to, or the operator, the relation less than or equal to, that we are familiar with is partially ordered, okay, over um, numbers of any kind. And now we define a subset X of A. But that means A has some of the values of A. Can be the entire A, doesn't matter. And then we'll define the predicate P of YX it is equaling to the following. Okay, so this is where you know, when the symbols you will start to become a little bit of an obstacle if you have not been using these terms consistently over the semester. But I believe that we do have used you know, the quantifiers you know, quite consistently in this new class. So we'll try to take a look at this and say, uh, what does it mean? P y of x is true if and only if for every x in the set x, x is less than or equal to y using the less than or equal to that we defined a little bit earlier. What does it mean? Can someone tell me a, a shorter way to describe this? Or you can just read a little bit ahead. <laughs> Do it, do it either way, okay? Somebody can give me an answer of what does it mean when P of Y set X is true? Y is, just read a little bit ahead, you know, by maybe a sentence or so. Y is the, Y is the upper bound, very good, okay? So it is greater than everything in X. That's all we are trying to say. It is greater than or equal to everything in the set X and it is called an upper bound, okay? Um, let us also define you know, lowercase s as the supremum. So SUP is not italic because it's not the name of a variable. So the supremum, S is the supremum of X if and only if blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's, let's try to figure out what is that blah, 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 okay? So this part is the definition. You know, what does it mean when we say that lowercase s is the supremum of the set X? What does it mean? Well, okay, this is true if and only if this is also true. There's a conjunction here. All right, so we'll, we'll take a look at each part. The left-hand side of the conjunction is the easy part. Oh, okay, so lowercase s has to be the upper bound of all the values in X. We got that, okay? It's greater than or equal to everything in X. Okay, we got that. What about the other part? What about the right-hand side of the conjunction? It says, for
for all s prime, and the prime is not an operator here, it's not calculus, so prime is not an operator, it is just a special way of naming a variable. So for all s prime, we need this to be true. Okay, what, 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 what does it have to be? It says if s prime is also an upper bound of x, then it implies that lowercase s is less than or equal to s prime. So what does that mean? This is when you want to give yourself an example and go like, okay, I kind of need an example to, to find out what that means. So let's go ahead and use an example. I'm going to use my tablet here. Okay, so I'm going to set up the problem first so you cannot see how I'm setting it up. But you know, this is kind of important. So Okay, and I think that should do it. Um, so switch to here. Okay, so I'm going to give you set A as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, only six values. Okay, uh, and then we look at um, uppercase X, which is a subset, as just 1, 2, and 3. Uh, less than or equal to is as usual so i'm not going to make it any special so two is uh, one is less than or equal to one true one is less than or equal to two true and so on and so forth okay so i'm not redefining less than or equal to in any way we're just going to use the usual way of defining so I, I i'll ask you a few questions first okay so can you tell me what is p of two comma x what is it So what does P mean again? Hmm? P is a predicate, and the predicate is true if and only if y, y is the upper bound of x. So in this case, I'm asking is 2 an upper bound of x? Nope. This is false. Okay. What about 2 of 6x? Is 6 a upper bound of the set x? It is. Why not? Is 6 greater than or equal to 1? Is 6 greater than or equal to 2? Is 6 greater than or equal to 3? It is therefore an upper bound. In, in other words, the upper bound doesn't have to be in x. It has to be in a but it doesn't have to be an X. Is that okay? All right, okay. So in this case, can someone tell me what is um, the supremum? Sup X is what? So we are, we are looking at all the upper bounds, okay? We're looking at every single upper bound and ask, is there another upper bound that's, great, that's greater than or equal to you? Is there another upper bound that is greater than or equal to u? We're looking for the one upper bound that is less than or equal to all of the other upper bounds. So that means maybe it's helpful to identify all the upper bounds first, right? So what are the upper bounds here? There are more than one. So if I look at the, all the upper bounds as a set, what would that be? Okay, yes, go ahead. Three or bigger, very good. So three, four, five, six, they're all upper bounds, okay? Because if you plug in one into here, mm, it's gonna be false, right? If you plug in two, which I just did, it is false. But starting with three, it is true because is one less than or equal to three? Yes. Is two less than or equal to three? Yes. Is three less than or equal to itself? Yes. So three is an upper bound. Four is an upper bound, five is an upper bound, six is also an upper bound. Okay, so now the upper bounds consist of three, four, five, and six. There are four elements in this particular set. These are all upper bounds. I'm looking for the one upper bound that is less than or equal to all of the other upper bounds. So which one would it be? Three, very good, okay. So in this specific case, the supremum of x is simply 
it is essentially, quote unquote, the smallest of all the upper bounds. Is that okay? Some people look at this and go like, isn't that the same thing as the maximum of x? Well, yes, okay, in this very specific case, it is the case. So supremum of a set is essentially the maximum in the set, or what we understand as the maximum within a set. Is that okay? All right. Okay, I'm gonna write it down here, okay? So supremum of an x is basically the same thing as the maximum of all the values in x when x is a subset of, since we only deal with natural numbers and real numbers, let's throw real numbers into here, okay? As long as we're dealing with real numbers, we're good. So supremum is a fancy word to be to basically mean the same thing as maximum. Are we good so far? Yes. That's a good question because when I said it is almost the same thing, it implies that in some cases it is not the same thing. So when it is when A is only partially ordered but not totally ordered, then they are not the same thing. They are not necessarily the same thing. Because the implication only goes in one way. Everything that is totally ordered is automatically partially ordered. So since the real number set or the natural number set or the integer set is totally ordered in terms of less than or equal to, they are all partially ordered, which means that all of these terms would also apply. But you can also define a very awkward set for A that it is only partially ordered but not totally ordered. Then in that case, then the two are no longer the same. Because maximum is not even defined if you're dealing with a relation that is only partially ordered but not totally ordered over a set. So in those you know, kind of strange situations, strange from our perspective, because you know, we only deal with numbers in this class, but in some other situations, you know, this can happen. Where you know, the set that you're interested in, which is A, is only partially ordered. So in those cases, they are not the same. Supremum of A is defined, but maximum of A is not defined, or maximum of X is not defined. All right? But from our perspective, it's all cool. So infimum is kind of the, uh, the counterpart, which means it is kind of the same thing as a minimum. So look at supremum as maximum, infimum as minimum. So now we want to look at um, the, the limit of a sequence. Okay, so I think we have enough time. We got two minutes. We can talk about this, and then you know, we are going to talk, continue to talk about it on Wednesday, um, and also go over the problem that I just assigned you guys to kind of think about earlier. So we'll go ahead and define and take a look at this particular thing here. Okay, so let me uh, point to the whiteboard. So it says. That for every epsilon that is greater than zero, but it's a real number, the following has to be true. Okay, what do you mean by the following? So in this case, we already know k is the limit of the sequence of x as the index approaches infinity. Okay, so what does it mean? Okay, what properties does k have in this case if we already know that it is the limit of the sequence x as index i approaches to infinity. Somehow, for every epsilon that is greater than zero, this has to be true. What is, what is that? Okay, that turns out to be another quantified expression, which says there has to exist m, that is a natural number, and m is being used as an index, such that for every j that is greater than or equal to m, and you know, j also has to be an element of the natural number set. Finally, we get to the comparison. k, which is our limit, minus xj, which is an element in the sequence, has to be less than epsilon. That is the definition of limit. Now, to understand this concept, it may be helpful to draw a picture. So basically, we are looking at something 
that has a defined limit. Okay, so we I'm just drawing a random curve here. So you can kind of imagine that this curve eventually will become such a flat line that if you just look at it like a segment of that line, it is flat, okay, for the most part. So that means, you know, if you give me an epsilon, okay, so let's start with a big epsilon, okay, you give me a big epsilon, okay, so I'm going to say this is K, and you give me a big epsilon. So this is the initial epsilon. I go like, yep. Everything from here, this is M, this M exists, because this is zero, and blah, 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 M, this is a sequence, by the way. This is a sequence of XI, which is basically just, think of calculus deals with continuous values, like sine of something, two to the power I, blah, blah, blah. This is, con this is discrete, so we have one value here, one value here, blah, 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 like that. But starting with index M, everything after that is within epsilon of where k is, which is the flat line. Is that okay? You go like, okay, Tech, I'm going to give you a bigger challenge. I bet you, you cannot find this m when epsilon is smaller, right? So you give me a smaller epsilon, okay? Epsilon is this, sorry. Then go like, nope, I, I can still find it. I just have to move m a little bit to that side, to the right-hand side, but I can still find the m. Is that okay? So if k is truly the limit, of this entire sequence, what the, what the description is trying to say is, you can give me a tiny little epsilon, like 10 to the power of negative 27. That's a really small value. I go like, yep, I have to go through a few classrooms <laughs> if this line continues, but I will find you that m too, because everything x of m and beyond is going to be within epsilon from k. Okay, so I will leave this with you because you know this should remind you of certain concepts in pre-calc, and pre-calc is a prerequisite to this class, because we we have to start to think about what happens when things go really, really, really big. What is the behavior of a function when you know the the, the values, the parameters are approaching infinity? That's what we're dealing with here. Is that okay? All right, so I am going to see you guys on Wednesday and work on that problem that I gave you earlier, okay? Because the more you work on these problems, the more you can start to link all the things together, okay? All right, and I'm going to stop the recorder. I did start with the recorder today, so it's all good. <laughs>